Thank you to each one who took part in our service this morning, and thank you all for being here with us as we now embark on our study in 1 Thessalonians. We're looking at a letter to a young church this morning out of 1 Thessalonians 1.1. Perhaps some of you saw the passage we'll be using, a, a single verse, and did the math. There's 89 verses in 1 Thessalonians, but I promise we'll be moving a little bit more quickly. We're kind of using just the first verse because I'll be doing a lot of uh, background and, and, and some of the themes and that sort of thing, and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving. But this is, as, as the title indicates, it's a letter to a very young church. It's a church that Paul had founded and was with for a short time, and now he was writing to remind them some things. Uh, I'm sure in your Christian life and maybe just your school life, there's things you look back and you're like, I know I learned that in school, but it's, it's not with me anymore. Even not just important stuff, but stories and, and, and songs and that sort of thing. And that's kind of what Paul is doing here, that he doesn't want the foundation of the faith to be like that to the Thessalonian believers. And that's, oh yeah, that's something I knew once and now I've, I've moved past that. He, he wants to ground them in that as well as share new information. And that should be the, the case for us that we never want to move past the foundations. Hebrews talks about that, that, that we go beyond, that we learn new things, but we never forget those foundations of the faith. Uh, we never get over some of those things. So let's just start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. And if you're able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we do praise you for this letter from Paul, Lord, and just please guide us as we study it, that we would understand what you have us to learn from it, and that we would be reminded of these important things, as well as learn and, and be challenged by you. We thank you for the opportunity. Please guide me to speak only your truth. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> so, this morning, just out of this verse, we're going to consider the communicants. Who, who's writing? Who's he writing to? The contents, a little bit of the outline and theme of the book, and then the connection. What, what is the connection between these two? And then what's the connection between the, the author and the audience almost 2,000 years ago and us today? As I said, we're using this verse to really set the stage for the book as a whole. We want to set the context. Who, who sent it? Who received it? Why? What, what's the theme? What, what's all the points? Hopefully we'll get a little better understanding of that. So uh, as we move forward, sometimes we're really digging in to a book. It's easy to, to miss the forest for the trees. So we want to make sure we kind of have this outline that we can keep in the back of our mind as then we get into the, the nitty gritty for the rest of the time. So we have the communicants. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. And that's how the Pauline epistles start, right? Paul. That is who wrote it. The, you, could, you could think of it from being implied there. The letter is from Paul. In the ancient world, whereas today we sign a letter at the end, then it was at the beginning. So you knew who it was from. So we see here that Paul is the human author of this letter. And I want to look here for a moment at 2 Peter having some, some external uh, verification of this and, and, and just the impression that even in Paul's day, his letters had. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. A few things we want to notice here, that this is the Apostle Peter. He was aware of Paul's epistles, multiple of them. And as a little bit of an aside, many people use these verses uh, to support that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews because Peter was writing to Jewish believers and none of the letters we know were from Paul were to Jewish believers, so maybe he's referring to Hebrews here. But then he says all his epistles. Peter wrote this letter in about A.D. 66. So that's uh, within 15 years of Paul starting his epistles and, and much even at the same time Paul was writing his closing epistles. But within those few years, no less than Peter acknowledged Paul's epistles were important, but notice the end of verse 16, also the other scriptures. So Peter here, even in Paul's own lifetime, is acknowledging Paul, what Paul wrote is scripture. So we have 
affirmation that these letters were inspired. They were superintended by the Word. So it's Paul's Word by means of the Holy Ghost. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. So they shared the gospel, and we know it's not when we tell somebody the gospel, it's not just our words that have effect, it's the Holy Ghost speaks it. But this whole letter was superintended by the Holy Spirit. It is inspired, it is from God, and therefore inerrant. There is no error in this book. Now it's interesting, Paul... He just says, I'm Paul. He, he doesn't use any title in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians. And in part, maybe that's because these, these believers, they intimately knew Paul. They, he, he didn't require any introduction. But also, and the, part of the reason I'm starting here, is because these two are, are among the earliest, if not the two earliest epistles, inspired epistles, that Paul wrote. So, so the kind of the normal pattern wasn't set yet. All other of his epistles have at least one or more titles. Eight times he refers to himself as Paul, an apostle, uh, a called out and sent one, empowered by God. Three times he calls himself a servant. In Philemon, he calls himself a prisoner. And I find that combination interesting, that, that he's still a humble man. He, he's a servant, he's a prisoner, he's not above that, but yet he is an apostle. He is commissioned by God, and, and his letters carry authority. This letter was authoritative to the church at Thessalonica, and frankly, it's authoritative to us today because he was an apostle, and this came by inspiration of God. So, written by Paul. I don't think that was any great mystery to any of you, but he's not alone, and Silvanus and Timotheus. Paul usually didn't work alone. Paul, we usually see him with, with a group of men with him who were ministering, who were helping, who were, who were doing different things. And so we have two of them named here. Also, we know that by and large, Paul didn't physically write his own letters. He, he received inspiration of the Holy Spirit and, and he spoke the letters and the Holy Spirit superintended, but somebody else wrote them down. And we're not sure why. It might be because of the, the eye problem Paul had that just made it very difficult to write. Uh, but Romans 16.22, the guy that wrote said, hey, yeah, I'm the one that wrote this letter. So it's possible that, that one of these two men was the one that actually penned it. But uh, these two men, Silvanus and Timotheus, better known to us as Silas and Timothy. And we're going to look at them both briefly in the book of Acts. Turn with me to Acts chapter 15. And we see Silas introduced. Acts 15.22. 22. So this is after the council at Jerusalem where, where Paul went and, and shared his ministry to the Gentiles and there were Pharisees that said, well, that's fine, but the Gentiles, they need to come under the law. And then Peter spoke and then James made the final decision of no, they don't, uh, the, the Gentiles don't need to come. But then they need to tell people this decision. So Acts 15, 22. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So we see Silas was a chief man in the church at Jerusalem. He was, he, he was recognized and, and respected and esteemed. He was somewhat of a big deal. And they were one that said, okay, we can trust you. You need to go to Antioch and other places and tell them that they are not bound by the law. Verses 26 and 27, this is further describing these two men. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same thing by mouth. So even at this point, Silas had hazarded his life. He had been under the, the gun, so to speak, for the gospel. And, and then he, he, he went out, he went along with Paul and Barnabas. And then in verse 40 of that chapter, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So in the first missionary journey, it was Paul and Barnabas, and then they have the, the dispute over whether John Mark should be allowed to come. Barnabas goes with John Mark to Cyprus, and then Paul chooses Silas, and so Silas is going to accompany him on his second missionary journey. And it's on that second missionary journey that the church at Thessalonica was founded, so Silas was there. We also find out from Acts 16.37, Silas was a Roman citizen. So just like with Paul, that was helpful in, in gaining him some protection. And, and even Peter in 1 Peter 5.12 calls attention to Silas as a beloved brother. So he was a, a, a great man of the faith. 
Now someone, I hope you're still there in Acts, we'll go to the next chapter, Acts 16, and see a little bit more about Timotheus or Timothy. Then, he, then came he, that's Paul, to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was re- well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him, could Paul, him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. So Timothy was from the, the town in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, of Lystra. He's half Jew, Jewish on his mom's side, a Greek on his father's side. But 2 Timothy 1.5 talk about his mother and grandmother being very faithful. These women were faithful in, in Judaism. They taught him the scriptures, the Old Testament, from a little boy. And then it seemed that uh, Timothy's mother got saved and when Paul went to Lystra in his first missionary journey. And then they shared the gospel with Timothy, but it seems he didn't get saved until Paul returned in his second missionary journey because the way Paul refers to him as a son in the faith makes it seem that that he was directly saved under Paul's ministry there. So during the second missionary journey, Timothy gets saved, and and then while Paul was there, the the, the people of that town and the church, they recognized him as called by God. Uh, They they actually commissioned him. 1 Timothy 4.14, it talks about the gift that was given to you by the laying on of hands. That really means that they recognized that he had a, the gift of evangelism, the gift of ministry, and they ordained him in praying over him with hands and sent him off with Paul. So he was with Paul for the rest of his second missionary journey. He, he was on part of the third missionary journey, but also t- Paul would often send Timothy out. If there was some place Paul couldn't go, Timothy would go and meet with those believers and check out the situation. And I do want to look at one example of that in Philippians chapter 2. Because we see here not only uh, what Timothy would do, but something of his character and the way Paul thought of him. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 and 22. Paul writing, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I may be of good comfort when I know of your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. So Paul said, I'm sending Timothy because there's nobody that's going to care for you. Nobody loves you. Nobody's going to be selfish towards you like Timothy. And, and he, Timothy labored with Paul like a father and a son in the faith. And also in, in 2 Timothy, Paul is ready to die, and he's desiring for Timothy to be with him. So that's the close personal connection these men had. So again, these were great men of the faith, and they were both with Paul on his second missionary journey when the church at Thessalonica was founded. And, and so Paul, as he writes back to them, he's saying, hey, you got more or less, Timothy and Silas say hi. They're doing okay, and, and, and they send their greetings to you all. And, and those are things that's easy for us to pass over, but I just think it's important for us to remember that these were real people in a real point in time, and they had brotherly love one for another and wanted to share that. Now, where are they writing? They're, they're writing to the church of the Thessalonians. The church was in the city of Thessalonica. Uh, might, truly in Greek, it's probably better pronounced Thessalonica, but you'll generally hear it Thessalonica. And that is, it's on the coast of modern-day Greece. So if you kind of picture Greece, it's kind of got that... Uh, peninsula part that sticks out, but then there's the part that kind of juts out along and is on the southern coast of the Balkans, and and that's kind of at that meeting point is where Thessalonica is, in the kind of the north uh, western tip of the Aegean Sea, uh, which is the Thermaic Gulf or the Gulf of Salonica, if you're uh, if you know your European ge- geography. But, but Thessalonica was and is the largest, at the largest bay, the largest protected gulf in the whole Balkan Peninsula. So it's a very important place. In, in the day Paul was writing this, it was, it was part of the region of, of Macedonia, which encapsulated all of what is now northern Greece, and it was the capital of that 
administrative province. It was the largest city in the region. It was on the Via Ignatia, which was a, the main Roman road from the Aegean Sea to the, the Adriatic. So it was a key seaport. It was on a main road. So it was, a, it was a big trade hub. It was a very cosmopolitan city. You had Jews, you had Greeks, you had Thracians, Romans. It was a political and, and military center. So if Paul was going to pick a place from which the gospel was going to go forth in that region, he couldn't have picked a better one than Thessalonica. And, and it's important enough that there's still a city there, Thessaloniki, modern Greek city. It's still the second largest city in Greece after Athens. It's still an important trade hub, and it's got a combination of, of ancient buildings and ruins and extremely modern city center. So this is where Paul's brethren that he was writing to, this is where they lived. But he's writing unto the church. The Greek word you, you might know is ecclesia. And ecclesia mean, means the called out ones, an assembly. The, the root of that, how it was used in Greek secular, was, was for the legislative assembly, that some would be called out of the populace to, to, to make rulings and decisions. So it was a called out assembly. And we've talked before about the church, how there's two aspects of it. There is a, the universal assembly of all believers. When Matthew 16, 18, when Christ says, I will build my church, he wasn't saying when I build this church, congregation in Greencastle, Pennsylvania. He was talking about all believers throughout all the church age. Ephesians 5.25 speaks of as a husband for a wife, the love that Christ has for his church. And I know I'm beating that just a little bit in the last couple weeks, but it's important because there are some relatively like-minded groups that deny the universal church and say that all that exists is the local assembly. And that's against scripture. There is no doubt a universal church, but in this age, God is working through the local assembly. So Paul is writing to the local church that is there in Thessalonica. And it's just a little interesting the way this is worded, that the other epistles are associated with the city, the church in Corinth, the church in Th Philippi. Here it's with the people of the Thessalonians. He, he's writing to the, the people themselves. And I don't, there, there's not a good reason, it seems, why that difference, but it's just how he addressed this. And just coming back to what I mentioned earlier, it's important for us to remember that though this letter is inspired, so it is good for us and 100% true for us today, Paul had a specific audience in mind when he wrote it, and just understanding that is going to help. Well, why is Paul wording it this way? Or why is Paul saying this? Well, because there was a real church which a real problem that he was addressing. So that can, I think that helps keep us from, from twisting Scripture and making us fit what we want it to today to, to see the context of what was going on with them. So he's writing to the church at Thessalonica. And just a little history. Well, why is he writing to them? How did Paul know them? Let, let's go back to the book of Acts now to Acts 17. To, to look just briefly at Paul's ministry there and, and the founding of the church at Thessalonica. It was during his second missionary journey. So if you remember the first missionary journey, Paul uh, went from Antioch and he just stayed in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. On the second missionary journey, he was going along and Paul said, well, I want to go here. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. And then he heard the, the, the vision of the man calling from Macedonia, which was, uh, if you're familiar where Constantinople was, just, just the other side uh, of the Bosphorus Strait there in Europe. To that point, the gospel had never gone to Europe and Paul was called into Europe into what is now modern Greece. He went first to Philippi, and then the second place we see him stopping and ministering is Thessalonica. Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scripture, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. So, Paul, as his habit was, as the gospel describes it in, in Romans 1, to the Jew first. He goes to his people. There was, there was enough Jews there that there was a synagogue. He goes to the synagogue. And remember that Paul was a trained rabbi. So they would have an opportunity. Does anybody have something to say? And, and Paul was trained and he could exposit the scripture. And he did that. But what he spent his time doing was he said, all right, let's look at the Messiah. And they were looking for what we know of today as Christ's second advent, the power of the kingdom. But Paul would go to passages, I think, like maybe Isaiah 53 and, and the like. And, and see, see 
the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again. It was all prophesied. So he'd teach them that about Messiah, and then he would bring alongside the life of Jesus of Nazareth and say, see that this Jesus, this man Jesus, he is the Christ, the Son of God. And, and, and many believed, many Jews believed, and when it talks there about devout Greeks, that would be proselytes, Gentiles who, who respected Judaism and appreciated Judaism and, and probably practiced it, but, but stopped short of, of committing to circumcision and officially becoming a Jew. But they were important because they were kind of a buffer, that, that they kind of kept the other Gentiles at bay and, and, and were a source of protection to the Jewish community there. In 1 Thessalonians 1.9, it speaks about to the audience how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So I, I'm inclined to believe that after this primary ministry to the Jews, he went to the Gentiles because I don't think you could... He, he wouldn't be saying you turn from idols to, to Jewish people. So you notice there the three Sabbaths. So a lot of people say, oh, Paul only spent three weeks there. I'm inclined to believe Paul was there a little bit longer ministering to the, the Gentiles as, where, as well. Um, because in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.12, it speaks about how he established the church. He set up elders. Uh, in Philippians 4.16, it said the Philippians actually sent support to Paul twice, once when he was in Thessalonica. So Paul was probably there for longer than three weeks, maybe a couple months, but it wasn't at all a long time. But as so often happened, Paul was having fruit in his ministry. People were getting saved, and then people didn't like it. In this case, it was primary. In, in Philippi, it was the, the Gentiles, the the people that were losing out on money on selling idols, here it was the Jews. Because A, they were losing converts to Paul, but B, kind of their background support these proselytes, they were becoming Christians and the, Paul, the, the Jews felt very uncomfortable, so then they kind of stirred up a crowd and, verse, and they were trying to hunt down Paul and Silas and Acts 17, 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren to the rulers of the city, crying, these are they that turned the world upside down are come hither also. So they, they grabbed whoever they could, the Christian leaders, uh, this man Jason, who it seems that's who Paul was staying with, and, and they said, these are the ones that have turned the world upside down, and they are now come here. And I just want to think about that a moment. The, turn the world upside down. That is what the gospel ought to do. To turn the world upside down, to... to kind of stand against all our preconceptions, to stand against the way the world does things. And, and all too often today, I'm afraid, we're content to let the, the gospel fit in with the way we do things, that we make a segment for it or we kind of fit it in, whereas it, the gospel should turn the world upside down. It's not going to be comfortable with, okay, you, you, you share an economic theory with me so we can get along, that's okay, the, the gospel is going to, to change lives. And, and if people are really on fire for the Lord, it's going to change communities and, and change the world. The gospel turns the world upside down. But what happened then is, is the rulers were fair-minded and they said, okay, this Jason fellow, he's going to be surety. Basically, if Paul and Silas show back up, he's going to be responsible and we're going to punish him. So Paul and Silas were able to leave safely, but, but they couldn't go back. And so Paul had much more he wanted to share. He'd only been with them a, a very short time. They had the foundations of the faith, but, but they didn't have more. And, and all the believers were, there were new, so their, their leadership wasn't very mature. So, so Paul needed to confirm the reality of their faith. He needed to encourage them. He needed to answer their questions. And so he turned to writing. And we can praise the Lord that Paul got kicked out because if he just told them all that by mouth, we, we wouldn't have this inspired epistle that we do today. So that's kind of the why and the background and, and, and who is Paul and why is he talking to the Thessalonians. Secondly, the contents. Just a little bit of background of the letter and the, some of what I think is the themes and the broad brushes. This letter was written about A.D. 51. It was in Paul's second missionary journey when he spent 18 months in Corinth. So he, he went to Thessalonica, and then pretty shortly after that, he went to Corinth, which is in the southern part of Greece, and ministered there a long while. And he had a heart for the Thessalonians, and he couldn't go back, so instead he wrote this letter probably six months to a year after he had left them. He, he heard there was some trouble, so, some issues, some things they had questions on, so he wrote this letter. And the theme, as I put it, 
is the effective ministry of the Word of God in light of Christ's return. Many things you read about 1 Thessalonians, it's all about the eschatological aspect of it. It's all about the return of, people just say the theme of 1 Thessalonians is the return of Christ, but I think that misses a lot. Yes, it's there consistently, but in the first three chapters, it's just basically one verse in each chapter. What, what I see is, is Paul talking about the gospel. As we're going to see, he's talking about the gospel, how they received it, and how it was effective in changing their lives, and he's exhorting them to live it even more, and all of that's in light of the return of Christ. So it's how they live and how the Word of God works with an eye towards Christ's return. He, he's reminding them of their foundational truths, which he taught them. He's reminding them of the the effect that they can see in their own lives and the truth that they know, and he's urging them on to maturity. But then every chapter ends with an eye towards the the coming of Christ. Uh, Chapter 110, 219, 313, 4, 15 to 17, 5, 23. We'll look at a couple of those examples that Paul will be saying, yeah, I told you to do all these things as we wait for the return of the Lord. So while... The future, pa- I mean, First Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17, out- outstanding, but we don't want to look at the future to the extent that we miss the, the great testimony of these believers and the exhortations that Paul is giving them. So the, the way I kind of, some, some of the sub-themes, and, and these aren't just neat that this is chapter 1, this is chapter 2, etc., but what I see Paul saying is that they had received the gospel, and the gospel had reformed them, and he's giving them reminders of how to live for the Lord, and then he's emphasizing that with the return of Christ. So first, the, these people had received the gospel and the foundational doctrines of the faith. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5 For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. This was something brand new to the Thessalonians. They had never heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and Paul had shared it with them. But they knew that it wasn't just what Paul was saying. There was something more to it. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. And praise the Lord that even today, the Holy Spirit goes out wherever the gospel is preached. Because John 6, no man come unto me except the Father, draw him. And that's true, but... There's nothing in Scripture at all that says the drawing of the Father is limited. I believe any time the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit is drawing any who hear it to faith. It's whether we believe that and allow Him to work or we reject it. 1 Thessalonians 2.1 For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Paul's, even though Paul was there a short time and he got kicked out, He's saying it wasn't a waste of time. It wasn't in vain because they had received and believed his message of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2.6 Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostle of Christ. So Paul is defending his ministry. He's saying we didn't ask anything of you. We supported ourselves because we didn't want anybody to be able to, to say we were just money grubbing as, as we... Uh, shared the gospel, but, but he says, what, what was their whole role? They did all of this, not for personal glory, but that others might believe. It was out of love, not personal gain. So he's reminding, especially in the early couple chapters here, remember what we taught you. Remember what we taught you. E- even in, in chapter 4, when he's talking about the, the, the coming of Christ, he says, remember, I told you these things. So remember what we told you. And he says they were reformed. The the Thessalonians, they just hadn't learned this stuff academically. They hadn't just gotten a a systematic theology that they could recite. Their lives had been changed by the gospel. Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. He said, we came, we shared the gospel with you, and your lives were changed. You suffered persecution for it, but you were able to have joy because of the Holy Ghost. And Paul is saying, now, as a church, you're an example to Macedonia and Achaia. That's basically northern Greece and southern Greece. So to all the Greek believers, they are an example because of what the gospel had done in 
their lives. They were disciples. They were true followers of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 For ye, brother, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Again, they, this wasn't just some words, because when tribulation came, hard times came, if it was just an academic idea, they would have given it up. But he says, just like in Judea, they suffered persecution of the Jews. Now your own countrymen there in Thessalonica are persecuting you, but you are overcoming that by the word of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 3.3 3, That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. That they are holding fast to the faith. They know that hard times and trials are going to come, and they are holding fast to the faith even in the midst of them. That is, they are reformed. That's the change that the gospel has made to them. And that's especially the first two chapters and then kind of into chapter 3. But, but especially starting in chapter 3, then Paul's like, all right, we, we know that. That's, this is what has happened, but let's not be satisfied. Here, here's what we need to go on to. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another and towards all men, even as we do towards you. Yeah, you've got a church, you love one another, you love us, but now let the Lord make you increase in it. Let the Lord increase your love for the brethren. For one, furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and please God, so ye would abound more and more. And this could really kind of be a theme verse for the book, I think, that, that they have received the gospel, they were saved, they have received how to walk, and now they need to abound more and more in it. They need to increase in what they are doing. So Paul is, remember, these are young believers. Most of them are saved no more than 18 months, probably all less than a year. And Paul's not content, okay, you guys are doing fine. No, he said, all right, you're saved. Let's get working at it. Let's grow. Let's increase in faith. Let's increase in understanding. Let, let's be strong in it. And then many of you will be familiar with chapter 5, verses 16 to 22. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearances of evil. These short exhortations, kind of a command, if you want to live the Christian life, this is God's will for you. This is what he desires of you through Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how to live faithfully in the Christian life. And again, I think these are probably all things that, that we wrestle with and maybe have challenges with. And Paul's writing these to people that were saved and a church that was set up less than a year before that they needed to get on and do these things. So these are the reminders of how they ought to grow and, and exhorting them to grow. But again, all of this is done in light then of the return of Christ. Back in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So chapter 1, Paul's kind of been reviewing, okay, we shared the gospel, you're living it out, you know that you are saved, that you're examples, and now we're waiting for the return of Christ, who saves us from the wrath to come. An intimation of introducing the great tribulation but also the believer's deliverance from it, that, that we're not looking for the great tribulation, we're looking for the return of Christ to take us unto himself. 2.19, likewise, kind of capstoning the chapter. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Again, Paul has described the change the gospel wrought in their lives and the hardship, the trials they're going through because of that, but then our hope, our joy... Paul is saying is that you're being, you're, you're being persecuted, we're being persecuted, but our joy is that we're going to see one another when Christ returns because we are all believers and we're going to be raised together with him. And then, I'm sure you know, verses, chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is the, the Bible's most complete picture of, of the rapture, of the raising of the dead saints, and, and the change of the living saints to be with Christ before the great tribulation, the catching up of them together. But again, Paul's not telling them this for, the, for some knowledge. It's verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. There was the problem of false teaching that, well, Jesus didn't come back and people are dying. What's going to happen to them? Well, it, it doesn't matter. They're going to get raised as well. So Paul's not teaching them all this just that they can know and that they, and, and especially when we come to 2 Thessalonians, the problem was that some of them, oh, we heard about Christ going to return, so we're going to sit back and wait. And he had to kick him in the pants a little bit and said, hey, we got stuff to do until then. But this is what Paul is teaching them. that They have received the gospel. The gospel reformed them. They have reminders of how to live more for the Lord, and they're looking forward to Christ returning. But again, First and Second Thessalonians are, are the most eschatological. They're the most last things focused of all of Paul's epistles. And they were the two earliest written. I, and, and I said I'd come back to that. The, the only question is Galatians. Some people believe Galatians was written earlier. Probably more people believe it was just slightly after First and Second Thessalonians. But again, amongst his earliest letters to a church less than a year old. So eschatology is suitable for young believers and should be a basic part of the faith. It's not something we can say, well, that's, that's just going to happen what happens, so it's not important for us to study and look at. No, it's something very important for these young believers to understand. But the only way to rightly study eschatology, it, can't write, it shouldn't just be an academic debate and just looked at in a vacuum. The way it's supposed to be studied, according to Paul here, is in relation to the outlook, the behavior, and the comfort that it should give in this age. Paul says Christ is coming back and this is how he's doing it. Therefore, this is how you ought to be living in this age until that time comes. And 2 Thessalonians gets into that even more and more. That's when Paul says, I, I, it's been reported to me that there are busybodies and people are just basically sitting around waiting for the Lord to come back. And he says, remember what I said, if you don't work, neither should you eat. He's saying that physically, but he's saying that spiritually as well. But third here this morning, we've got, okay, who's writing? Paul, and he's writing to the Thessalonians. What's kind of the outline here of this book? Well then, what's the connection? What's the connection of, of the Thessalonians and Paul, and, and what's their connection to us today? And we see that, the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These people who make up the assembly, the church of the Thessalonians, these people and thus the assembly as a whole are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And, and we talked about that last week, how that's a key theme of Paul, being in Christ. They are in Christ. They are, they are saved, and, and they are in Christ, and Christ is in them. Uh, the Lord Jesus himself describes this in John chapter 6 and verse 56. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. In coming upon the promise of salvation is the promise of Christ dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit and, and us dwelling in Him. John 15, 5 carries the idea forward of abiding. Christ will abide in us as we abide in Him. And, and being in Christ, it should be sobering to us. You turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 15. There Paul writing to his, kind of his problem child, the, the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 6.15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? You yourselves are in Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. When we are in Christ and joined with believers in the body of Christ, when we commit sin, we, we, we bring sin into the congregation. We bring sin into the body of Christ. The name and the people of Christ, we bring them in contact 
with it. And what does Paul say to that? God forbid. He uses the strongest language he says. He, he can say that is an abomination, something that cannot happen. So if we are in Christ, we need to think about everywhere we go, everything we do, everything we say, that, that we connect Christ with that. But being in Christ is also a comfort. I'm sure you know John, the promise of John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. Christ says, and I give unto them, that is his sheep, that hear his voice, eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So when we are in Christ, there's no getting out of Christ. Our, our salvation and our eternity are sure. We are joined to the Father and the Son. Nothing can cut us off. So these believers, they are in the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the connection between Paul and his audience. They are physically separated. Paul, as far as he knows, may never be allowed to come back and physically see the Thessalonians again. But they are both in Christ and in God. So even when they are physically apart, they are spiritually united. And that's likewise with us, believers all over the world, believers over the last almost 2,000 years, we are spiritually united and we should have a kinship joyfully with them. People we might not see eye to eye with, but in Christ, we're both believers, we are united with them. We are both in God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that, to them then, Paul can wish them, grace be unto you and peace. He wishes them all to have grace and peace. And this is, we see this in every one of Paul's epistles that have his name. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost word for word or just very minor modifications of that. That is what Paul desires for his, his readers, all believers. And it's interesting because grace, charis in Greek, that, that was the, the Greek greeting when, when you Instead of saying, hey, hello, it was, it was charis. They, they wished grace one to another. And grace, in the secular way, is just it's an unexpected or undeserved gift bringing joy and delight. So, so when you just walk up and say grace to somebody, it's saying either may my presence or may something today be even undeserved, bring you joy and delight. Paul had many Gentile readers, so it makes sense for him to wish them grace, peace, Irene in the Greek, but in, in Hebrew, it's shalom. That's the, the Jewish and, and really kind of the whole Eastern in, in the Middle East. It was a common greeting. The idea there is an absence of war and an absence of struggle in a world that's absolutely full of, of war and struggle. So he wishes them grace and peace. He wishes that to every group, every church he writes to. And actually in Timothy and Titus, he adds mercy, a uh, pastor of a dear flock, he, he calls them to also have mercy, that, that they might have mercy from their congregation and that they might have mercy for other believers. But grace and peace. But where are they going to get this grace and peace? From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As believers, we have access to a unique grace, a unique peace that the world cannot give. Where do we get them from? The Trinity. From God, the Father, from Jesus Christ, and the Spirit is not mentioned here, but we know He is the active agent that, that delivers these things in our lives. Far from man's grace, we get God's grace. And grace, we know, is the keystone of Paul's gospel. The unmerited favor of God towards sinful man. Far above just being a greeting, wishing them earthly delight, God's grace brings what nothing else can. It brings a right relationship with God. It brings salvation. It, it brings expunging of the record, a loss of eternal punishment in hell, and the gain of not only temporal delight, but eternal bliss. That's what Paul wishes his believers in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God's grace enables us to have a relationship with Him that He is our Father. Rather than just our Creator, He's our Father, and we can rejoice in that. We are totally unworthy of it, but we receive it from the Father, and then that should dominate our relation with other believers. We have been forgiven and, and received God's grace, and so have they, so our dealings one with another ought to be characterized by this loving grace. And then peace. I said, when the Jews wish it, that was basically 
I hope things go easy for you today. I hope there's no war. I hope there's no strife and struggle. But God's peace is not the absence of trouble, but in fact, it's an eternal calm that, we can, that can withstand trouble. The world's peace is a definition by absence. It's the absence of struggle. It's the absence of strife, whereas God's peace is something positive. It's not the lack of something, but God grants us peace itself that regardless of the circumstances or what is going on, that we can have that internal tranquility and peace within us. And again, we receive these because God's not only our creator, but he is our loving father. He loves, he cares, he provides, he protects. From God our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. This man Jesus is the Christ and, and that, remember, that's what Paul taught them there in the synagogue, that he is the anointed Messiah, he is the Savior of the world, and then we make him our Lord, the master and director of our lives. So this is what we're going to be, for the next months outside of Christmas, looking at. The, the foundations of the faith in light uh, of the coming of Christ. And again, time and again, we're going we're to try to hold those in balance I don't know, there, there's a temptation to always look at those eschatological passages, just get our eyes on the return of Christ and miss all the encouragement and the challenge that Paul has for us there. M many of some of you hunters have had a similar circumstance to me where there was an opening, that's where the deer's going to come. Or you see some, a deer fooling around way out there and you're in the scope and you're in the binoculars and you're looking, 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 and then you hear the rustle and... The other deer is here 15 feet away from you. That your focus is so distant and so tunneled that you miss what is around you. And I don't want that to be our case here. I want us to have the joy of Christ's return, but also looking at all these things that Paul wants to show us. We've seen this morning the communicants. Paul, Silas, Timothy. Loving ministers of the gospel writing to this young church at Thessalonica. The contents. They received the gospel. The gospel reformed them. They are reminded to live it out more and more, and they're reminded of the returning of Christ. And then their connection is that they are both in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm challenged here as we study all the, the deep and important truths that are in here. These young believers had that firmness of the doctrine. Do we have the same solid foundation? How much more should we? More importantly, they were examples to all those around them. They saw it lived out in their lives, just as we ought to. It, it ought to be effective. The Word of God should bring grace, should bring peace in our lives, and to the point where this gospel has the power to turn the world upside down. To turn the world upside down. And I'm not going to go off too much here, but... Again, friend, God is not bound by the structures of this world. He's not bound by the power and institutions of men. What happens Tuesday is, is no doubt important and meaningful to our lives, but if that's what you have focused on most, and frankly, if that, you think that's going to determine when Christ comes back or what he's doing in this world, your perspective is wrong. The gospel has the power to turn the world upside down. So we will do our part here Politically, but the greater focus then is what are we called to do until Christ returns in a spiritual way? Do you, share the go do you speak the gospel as much as you talk about what you think of our political leadership or what you think of this election? That's where the power is, friend. That's how we're going to be ready for the return of Christ. So, so I ask each and every one of you, Paul shared the gospel and these believers received it. Have you received the gospel of Jesus Christ? That... This man, Jesus, that he was God the Son, that he came to earth and lived a sinless life, that he died on a cross, but he rose again three days later, and now he offers salvation to anybody who will confess their sin and put saving faith in him. If you've done that, if you're honest, can you look at your life and see that it has been effective? Have you let the gospel have free course in your life to, to work and, and to change it? Are you honestly experiencing the grace and peace of God, regardless of of whatever is going on is, is what happens in your family, in, in this nation politically. Is that what determines your joy? Is that what determines your comfort? Or do you have it from the Lord? 
Friend, are you ready to turn the world upside down for Christ? Are you ready to serve faithfully so you can have joy when he does return? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we praise and thank you for this challenge from Paul. We thank you for bringing out circumstances that he would write this letter and, and for your superintending of it that we know it's good for us today, Lord. And I pray that you would just challenge us all. Please remind us of the gospel, Lord. If there's one here that has never received Christ as Savior, I pray today might be the day of salvation. And for us as believers, Lord, help us take an honest inventory of our life. Is it being worked out? Are the, the grace and peace of you in that the way they ought to be? And if not, Lord, help us to see what we are doing to hinder it. Lord, we pray free course for the gospel. That, that even by our service, Lord, that it might turn maybe just first our families and our communities and, and then it could turn the world upside down, Lord. Please help our full faith and trust to be in you in all things. And, and then please help us to just labor as you direct until the coming of Christ. We love you, Lord, and we ask all these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord's put.